For gaming or work, the Prime A series is one of Asus best sellers and for almost a decade has shown not only computing power but also versatility. In short, it is a big deal for Asus. Today, we are reviewing the Prime Z790A from Asus, the white spectrum board of boards loyally here to service all your computing needs. Fun fact for you, alligators are in a permanent state of eruption. Permanent. Educate the masses. That's that's what I say. So the Prime is the more affordable, good for everything motherboard, and the A, it's more adventurous model. And it has silently been picking some premium along the years, and today it is a much more finished, engineered and premium model than what it used to be. And as usual, with brand new chipset comes the times for manufacturers to show us what they've been cooking this entire past year, or just shamelessly milking last year's design. Now, starting with the obvious. We're dealing with a six-layered PCB ATX motherboard, which is what you expect for a good PCI signal isolation and a robust overall product. Nothing bad here. Now, design-wise, well, the Prime did not reinvent the wheel and decided to stay with the last year overall tech robot design, which, by the way, I absolutely love. I mean, we have a very nice sanded finish on all cooling components, and the white themes works beautifully on the Prime as it did last year. RGB-wise, we do have some RGB LEDs embedded on our IU roof, which discreetly yet brightly shine some hope on our darkest hours, searching the sense of life in the filth pit, which is our soul. Now, if that was not enough, we also have four RGB connectors, three of which are addressable. Now, CPU socket-wise, we have our usual LGA 1700 Intel had introduced last year, which will offer support both for 12th and 13th generation of Intel Core processors and bring PCIe 5.0 lanes to our board as well. Now, VRM-wise, well, that's what I meant by milking it. This is an identical configuration we saw on its predecessor, which is not a bad thing since we still have a very capable 1020 amps worth of power organized in an eight parallel phases dedicated to our CPU. Obviously, this is more than enough to operate and severely uh, overclock any processors in the 12th and 13th generation of uh, Intel Core uh, well processors. But my, my only concern here is that, well, it's exactly what we had last year and that is the very first of a very long list on this motherboard. Cooling-wise, we got these wavy, large and thick VRM blocks, which do provide quite a bit of radiating area. The main blocks retain its larger radiating roof, aka extended design, and on the side block, we can observe several radiating winglets on both of its sides, all of which contribute to a higher rate of heat dissipation. Now, both of them also features a double contact design, which does allow the blocks to have a direct thermal padded contact with the power stages and chokes for faster and greater heat transfer. And unsurprisingly, thermal results are, well, uh, as we saw last year, which is very, very good. With an overclocked i7-13700K and a long-lasting synthetic stress test, the temperature orbits around 50 to 55 degrees Celsius, which is obviously the hallmark of what should be a very stable and long-lasting motherboard. Overall, uh, despite not being the most agile VRM, I mean, we are talking about parallel phases here, it still is strong enough and fast enough to comfortably keep a higher tier uh, processor uh, overclocked stably for a long period of time. So uh, I definitely see this motherboard being coupled with, uh, uh, say, uh, i7 or even i9 of either 12th or 13th generation of Intel Core processors. Now, memory-wise, our prime board supports up to 128GB of DDR5 RAM organized in a double-channel configuration and overclockable up to whooping 7GHz, which is 1000MHz more than last year model and the unique, I want to say, difference between those two models. Um, but, but just to be very clear, 1000 megahertz seems a lot on paper, but gaming wise, you won't see any noticeable difference. Uh, but on uh, memory intensive tasks such as content creation and so on, this is a big plus. So it's definitely something which 
will attract content creators. Now, staying in the memory, we have four M.2 solid state drives, all of which are PCI 4.0 compliant, meaning that they can all swap data up to a very fast 64 gigabit per second each, configurable in red 0, 1, 5, and 10. To keep them cool, Asus kept the thick thermal padded heat shield we saw last year, which do a great job at keeping them all away from thermal throttling. Now, we do have a very fast and agile M.2 uh, storage solution, but my only regret here is the fact that, again, we do not have PCIe 5.0 lanes enabled M.2 connector, especially the CPU linked one, uh, because this is the only instance where we can rip benefit from the incredible PCIe 5.0 bandwidth abilities and something that I would suggest Asus and any other manufacturers to do uh, in the uh, you know, iteration motherboards to come, if that's a word or a sentence. But on the plus side, all of our M.2 solid state drive get the screwless treatment I like so much and that Asus did introduce a couple years ago absolutely love them. SATA-wise, we have four Jurassic Era SATA plugs, which will do everything they can to support your dust collecting legacy drives. Now, exports-wise, we do have five export slots, two 16 slots with different speeds, a dual slot, and two bachelor slots. As usual, our fastest is the closest to the CPU and provides 16 PCIe 5 lanes, swapping data up to whooping 64 gigabyte per second. Therefore, this is where you want to place your GPU for optimal performance hence the metallic reinforcement. Now, the other 16 slot runs four lanes at a fast PCIe 4.0 standard for a total of 8 gigabytes per second each, another small upgrade when compared to uh, its last year 4 gigabytes per second available bandwidth, but to be honest, not much you and your build will notice anyway. And again, I need to point out that having a PCIe 5.0 enabled GPU slot is totally useless since we will not have any video cards uh, uh, worthy of the PCIe 5.0 standard until at least 2026, a prediction I've been making and that I shall keep, but <sighs> instead, again, much wiser to get this PCIe 5.0 lanes redirected to the M.2 connector, maybe I am pissing in an empty violin. Who knows? Now, a quick word on a very subtle change on the GPU slot release mechanism, which is noticeably better. Again, subtle but a much more mature design coming from Asus, which seems more sturdy and less of a guesswork. So at least definitely a, a somewhat kudos for Asus to that. No, to Asus for that. Yeah. Now, back IO wise. First, let me note the presence of a padded integrated back IO plate. Very nice. And starting from the left, we got a display port and HDMI output for our integrated graphics, four third generation USB plugs able to transfer data up to five gigabit per second, four 3.2 second generation USB plugs able to transfer up to 10 gigabit per second, except this type C, which runs on a dual channel and can therefore spew up 20 gigabit per second, earning its unofficial USB 4 naming. Our dual band Wi-Fi 6E adapter able to transfer in that cleaner and much faster 6 GHz spectrum. Next we have our 2.5 Gigabit LAN and our rather premium 8 channel 1220S audio codec from Realtek, which even slightly aged does a great job at providing a rich audio experience both in gaming and other sound shenanigans. But most importantly, it has a very good um, a studio grade recording abilities which you know should please uh, uh, streamers and content creators out there. My only regret with it is the disappearance of the spdiff output, which did add a nice premium audio playback touch. Overall, and again, apart from the addition of a Wi-Fi 6 model, which by the way is a very good thing, we have the exact same back I.O. we had on last year's Prime Z690A, which is a little disappointing. I, I would have loved to see a little bit more uh, USBs, you know, bandwidth related stuff, but it's not there, so maybe Asus for next time. Now, chipset wise, the Z790 chipset doesn't exactly break boundaries either. On the good side, it stays at a very cool 6 watts footprint, allowing a rather small and light heat shield to keep it cool at all time. But for the rest, apart from a slightly higher PCIe 4 lane count and a slightly greater total PCIe bandwidth, we are dealing with an identical chipset 
than seen last year. Front panel connector wise, well, again, nothing new. Our usual two USB second generation front panel connectors, great for monitoring, a five gigabit USB third generation front panel connector, and our 10 gigabit type C, all of which were fully expected at this price range. Cooling wise, we got a rather generous seven PWM fan connectors, including a water pump connector, which is uh, exactly what you need to uh, entertain all likely cooling scenarios. Not exactly the most enthusiast uh, water cooling companion, but it it'll get you where you need to be for this kind of motherboard. Now, troubleshooting wise, we do have our usual uh, first aid debugger here to signal the main stages of our boot, the absolute bare minimum when you're dealing with a motherboard which juggles with no less than three different PCI standard. But we also have a powered soldered button, great for quick test boot without chassis, and a clear CMOS button which I find awkwardly placed and would have done so much more for itself if placed on the back I.O. But overall, obviously, a uh, uh, much more complete troubleshooting solution that you usually see in uh, entry-level motherboard. So that that's that's little troubleshooting kudos for Asus to that. No, two Asus for that. My God. Now, in conclusion, the Prime Z790A will cost 310 bucks before taxes, which is anywhere between 50 and 80 dollars more than its EZ690 predecessor. And the questions remain: Is it worth it? Ha! Let me say. Ah, between last year Prime Z690A and this year Prime Z790A, I have rarely seen such similar, to not say identical products. Going from design to VRM solution, passing through the storage and USB features, they are both mirror image one to another. I mean, I feel that the evolutions and upgrades are simply uh, too small, too minute. Uh, to account or to motivate any kind of price increase. I mean, do not get me wrong. This is um, um, a very fine and, and powerful and well-featured and robust motherboard. It is a great foundation for a mid-budget PC, but mainly because its predecessor was. In a nutshell, if you are already rocking a Prime Z690A, you do not need to upgrade at all. It'll make you more mad than happy believe me. And if you have nothing and looking for a great, sturdy, powerful, long-lasting mid-budget motherboard, well, you're in luck because the Prime Z690A, last year model, just went down in price.